Parker. I haven't seen you eat a single thing since you got here. Let me guess. Photosynthesis? Oh? What makes you say that? Well, a long time ago, I knew someone with a similar ability. Well, you are correct. Most of my body is covered with parasites. I supply them with water, and in return, I receive sugars they produce when exposed to light. Mm -hmm. It isn't just my skin either. The parasites also act as my eyes. They have replaced many of my internal organs as well. It is thanks to them that I live on after over a century. How did you obtain them anyway? Through your research? I would like to say as much, but there is more to it than that. Let me take you back 20 years. I had hit a dead end with my parasite research. Then I was approached by a foundation. They said they had a sample of an unusual strain of parasite. Which foundation? Apparently they had links to ARPA. But that is all I learned. I was somewhat ignorant of the ways of the world. Just being able to study it was enough for me. Yeah, I've heard that before. Go on. Half in doubt, I visited them to discover the body of an old man. Well, to be precise, his partial remains. A collection of parts, you could say. The man had died in an explosion. An old man, you say? His flesh had not decomposed. In fact, the tissue's cells were still metabolizing. The parasite had infected, or should I say assimilated with, the tissues, and was keeping them alive. I became obsessed with studying the body parts, foregoing food and even sleep. Every day was filled with new discoveries. The parasite's biology, internal anatomy, life cycle. But there was only so much I could learn through observation. And so I made a decision to truly know the parasites. I had to live with them. So you implanted them inside you from the dead man's flesh? Correct. <sighs> it was quite a gamble whether or not they would adapt to me. But fortunately, it appears I was compatible with them. Or perhaps, through my many years of research, my immune system learned to tolerate them. Were they that body's only parasite? Yes. However, there was a separate specimen that supplied its host with adrenaline in response to pain. And yet another that could control insects at will through secreting heterogeneous pheromones. I wanted exposure to them, to take them into me. But my wishes were denied. Their records, though, provided clues that helped advance my research. Would you care to join me? A life spent never worrying about food is a most wonderful one. I think I'll pass, but thanks. This has been helpful. The one that covers the parasite that lives on the surface of the skull's bodies is what gives them their power, similar to my children who live in my skin. I modified the parasites I isolated from the body of that old man differentiating them with various abilities. One that can blend perfectly into its surroundings by exposing the pigments in its cells at will. Another that by harboring multiple species of metallic archaea can oxidize and reduce metal. Isolating the one that covers and transplanting it into an artificial medium should provide the same abilities as the skulls but they can only subsist within a human body. Once transplanted into the medium, they will eventually die. Another thing, the weakness of the one that covers is desiccation. 
their surface moisture loss is greater than ours. The reason they give off mist is to alleviate this by releasing the salts inside them as microparticles. Water vapor condenses around them, appearing as mist. But this dries out the atmosphere until they cannot even produce mist. And once their supply of water from the host runs out, the parasites are in danger. They, along with their host, enter a form of suspended animation. However, a similar effect occurs if they come into contact with a large amount of water. Rain, for instance, the one that covers will temporarily abandon other processes in its eagerness to absorb the water. Pitiholone. Make the weather your ally. There's something I've been wondering. Why are you called Code Talker? During World War II, the U.S. military used the languages of different tribes, including the Navajo, as codes, right? I know the term code talker was used to mean people sent to the battlefield to speak in those codes. Were you one of them? Our mother tongue was indeed used for war. But I did not go. I was already over the conscription age. However, I was made to help craft the codes that were spoken. So in a wider sense, you could call me a code talker for that. Navajo is a complex language, and virtually no one outside the U.S. speaks it. They must have thought it was the perfect language to use as a code. Yeah, in the end, the Japanese never cracked it. The cipher is king in information warfare. Of course, they didn't simply speak in Navajo. They created substitutions for words according to a code book and then translated those into our language. Young Diné was sent to the front lines of the Pacific Theater as code talkers. To fight is an honor for the Diné. They were the pride of our people. But I cannot say this history brings me joy. Words are alive. When they are spoken, life is breathed into them. They become a part of the listener. Our words were transformed into lifeless cyphers and used for war. This, after the Black Anna spent generations suppressing the language. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I guess we shouldn't be calling you Code Talker, huh? No, I do not mind. The reason Skullface called me Code Talker was because I also am responsible for coding language into the vocal cord parasites. I am the same as those young warriors, used for a cipher's sake. I must never forget that. The name, Code Talker, is a lesson carved into my being. You said Skullface ordered you to weaponize the vocal cord parasites. But you also said he wasn't the reason. And he wasn't. I was seduced by the parasites. That is a fact. How? You mean from your curiosity as a scientist? That I cannot deny, but there is more to it. The story goes back to the 19th century, to my earliest memory. One day, a man from the government visited our Hogan, our home. I cried as he yanked me from my mother's arms and took me away to an Indian boarding school. From that day forward, I became George. This was the name my teacher gave me. I was forced to give up my Diné name. Forbidden from speaking anything but English. If we dared utter a word of filthy Navajo, the teacher made us eat a bar of soap. Yeah, that was the U.S. government's education policy for Native Americans. To erase our words was like erasing our people. Their education was tantamount to ethnic cleansing. Over time, the overt persecution of our language stopped. But to this day, it continues to be eaten away by the lingua franca, that is English. Many of the Diné outside the reservations can speak nothing else. And it isn't just our language. 
Across the world, minority languages are being destroyed by dominant languages. Many are on the verge of extinction. Hmm. Enter the vocal cord parasites. Yes. I began thinking that minority languages needed some sort of deterrent against dominant languages. In order that they, that their peoples and cultures would survive. It was then that I came across literature at the Foundation claiming that man acquired language thanks to a type of parasite. One that distinguishes between languages as a precursor to reproduction. If I could just resurrect it, make it more pathogenic, I would have my deterrent against English. But I failed to hide that aim from Skullface. He noticed. Yes. I wanted to retaliate against the English language. Though never did I intend to actually use it as he planned. You know how the story ends. I was forced to study how to make the parasites compatible with all the world's languages. All but English. However, he in fact secretly isolated an English strain. I will not be held prisoner by the man's phantom. The English strain must not be allowed to exist either. I have no doubt Skullface's plan is almost complete. At that point, I will no longer be of use to him. I must leave behind this record at least. A record of how the ancient vocal cord parasites became these abominable ethnic cleansing parasites. I believe he has two purposes for the ethnic cleansing parasites. The first, as their name suggests, is ethnic cleansing. This conflict between East and West that envelops the world will not last much longer. Once the Cold War ends, and the weight of America and the Soviet Union is lifted away, the ethnic conflicts they kept suppressed will all rise to the surface. It is not difficult to imagine that the radical sides will begin cleansing their adversaries. But what if an ethnic cleansing parasite matching the language of the aggressors were to be unleashed? The aggressors would be washed off the earth. At the very least, the idea that retaliation could eradicate your people would prove a powerful deterrent. The second purpose is the Englishization of the world. To cipher the organization, this is probably their main use. Man thinks in words, or rather, words are man's very means of thinking. If you erase a word representing some concept, Clouds. the concept Engine. itself disappears from the world. Nishone means beautiful in Navajo. But the image that comes to mind when we say Nishone differs from the Black Anas beautiful. An azure sky, a rolling landscape, lush greenery. The meaning we place in Nishone has its roots in Diné culture. If we lose the word Nishone, the images of our beautiful homeland would be washed away into oblivion along with it. Just as Orwell indicated years ago, Cypher, being based in America, is pushing Englishization for this very reason. Suppose all five billion people on this planet come to read, speak, and think in English. Their wills could also be streamlined under English. Cypher's control would be all the easier. Economic governance would progress in leaps and bounds. The ethnic cleansing parasites would be a great aid in accomplishing this goal. There is no need to destroy every language besides English. All they need to do is weaken other dominant languages competing with it. Russian, Chinese, Arabic. If people know they risk their lives speaking such languages, they will flock to the lingua franca that is English. 
Cipher need not even focus attention on smaller languages. After all, they are already being eaten away by English. Business, education, film, commodities. English has permeated every area of global society. I can see this Caution. when I look Please. at young Dene. Some of them have already lost their grasp of the Navajo language. It is said that over 2,000 languages of the world are facing extinction. This very moment, cultural concepts and forms of expression are disappearing forever. The spread of electronic networks gives greater meaning to Englishization. Networks have no national borders, but basing them on a single language, they can penetrate deeper into and between people. That basic point of unity provides the ideal environment for someone who aims to control people's wills. But how does this differ from building the Tower of Babel? The ethnic cleansing parasites attempt to rob man of his words. Such irony. It was the vocal cord parasites that gave words to him in the first place. Ancient man had no language. Unable to produce complex sounds due to the structure of the throat, he could communicate only through simple vocalizations and gestures. Then the vocal cord parasites infected his larynx. Man's transition to walking upright did not gift him solely with intelligence, but also with his voice. At the time, the vocal cord parasites never harmed man. They merely took a small measure of nourishment. In fact, you could call it a symbiotic relationship. Some animal species use particular vocalization patterns to attract a female and reproduce. Songbirds, certain insects, and also the vocal cord parasites. The difference is that the parasites themselves did not produce sounds. Rather, they had their hosts, man, do it for them. Once secure on the human host vocal cords, a male vocal cord parasite caused the host to produce a certain sound pattern, something like a warble of a bird. Meanwhile, females parasitizing other host pharynxes need only wait. Upon hearing the sound pattern of an attractive mate, they would manipulate their hosts into making contact with the person it came from. The female traveled through his host's saliva to the other host's vocal cords, where the male was waiting and the pair copulated. We can only imagine how the female manipulated his host, but it was probably through smell. Smells traveled directly to the limbic system via the olfactory cilia in the nasal cavity. Volatile compounds released by the female would stimulate the limbic system, which controls instincts making the host feel amorous. This kind of sexual selection naturally led to competition between the male parasites. Males that had their hosts produce sounds perceived by females as more attractive succeeded in copulating and producing offspring. Evolutionary traits caused by sexual selection are curious. The peacock's feathers the mannequins dance, the firefly's luminescence pattern. Even with courtship behaviors that are not advantageous to survival, those individuals that excel in them produce offspring, and it escalates with each generation. The same was true of the vocal cord parasites. Courtship vocalization rhythms and intonations became more sophisticated. And in order for man to produce such sounds, they had to alter his vocal organs. By lowering the position of the larynx and developing resonating chambers, they enabled more complex pronunciations. But that was not all. 
the vocal cord parasites activated a transcription factor that would later control man's language ability. A protein that due to its appearance is called 4 kid box protein P2, or Fox P2. Activating this transcription factor led to the development of brain function capable of creating sophisticated frequency changes. This was the pinnacle of the vocal cord parasite's prosperity. However, this sophisticated pronunciation control was too useful for man to ignore. Once human sexual activity ceased to be only seasonal, and having lost pigment-based sexual characteristics, distinctive vocalizations became the most effective means for humans to attract mates as well. Combined with logic pathways hardwired into the brain, or universal grammar, it was not long before advanced communication was possible. This was the birth of language. Luckily for man, it was around this time that a particular retrovirus was circulating. While not lethal, it infected not only man, but the vocal cord parasites as well. It is presumed that this virus removed part of the parasite's DNA and reverse transcribed it into man's reproductive cells. It was a vector. Among the genes it transcribed were the ones responsible for the production of language. The vocal cord parasite's vocalization genes were written into the human genome. The parasites were no longer of any use to man now. Man could use his voice as he pleased when he pleased, hindering the parasite's courtship vocalizations. Having lost their opportunity to reproduce, the parasites died out, leaving behind only the transcribed genes. The vocal cord parasites were once in symbiosis with man. Its genes even became a part of his. Humans and parasites are extremely close. As such, it will be extremely difficult for man's immune system to eliminate the vocal cord parasites even cutting them out will be no simple matter. Which is exactly why these ethnic cleansing oh, parasites are such a formidable weapon. The rise of the vocal cord parasites goes back approximately 300 million years to the Permian period. At that time, they were not even parasites, but predatory autotrophs. They are believed to have been the common ancestor to the Pentestamida and the Cyclops genus of copepods. However, Earth's environment underwent a violent change at the end of the Permian period. The cause is unclear, but evidence suggests that over 90% of the Earth's organisms at that time died out. The most pronounced threat to the proto-parasites was the severe reduction in oxygen concentration. The result was cladogenesis, a splitting that gave birth to a new strain that could parasitize other organisms' respiratory apparatus. This survival tactic helped lower their oxygen consumption, and inhabiting the throat kept them securely in contact with inhaled air. The best survivors were those that parasitized the reptiles that flourished at the time. Entering the Triassic period, the reptiles evolved into dinosaurs, and the proto-parasites shared in their success. Dinosaurs developed respiratory organs called air sacs to adapt to the low oxygen environment. These in particular helped the proto-parasites thrive. But another trial awaited them. The end of the Triassic period saw another drastic change in the Earth's environment. For most parasites, the male and female take the same host. Many are, in fact, hermaphrodites. Originally, the vocal cord parasites were as well. But for any strain to ride out a severe environmental change, it must secure a steady pool of genetic diversity. Another split. Now the newest strain, 
procreated with mates found in other hosts. And in order to increase its encounters with those mates, the new strain utilized the voice of its host. They came to inhabit the host's vocal cords. This truly was the birth of the vocal cord parasite. The parasites developed the host's pharynx to form resonating chambers and used them to produce sophisticated mating calls. The relatively upright posture of the dinosaurs was important in this because the crooked L-shaped pharynx was more suited to the development of resonating chambers. These developments ushered in a time of great prosperity for the parasites. But for the third time, the parasites had a major hurdle to overcome. The meteorite impact at the end of the Cretaceous period, which spelled the end of the dinosaurs. With their hosts extinct, the vocal cord parasites had no option but to find a new habitat. Birds, as genetic successors to the dinosaurs with functioning air sac apparatus already in place. Birds were the perfect choice. But the parasites could not survive in birds that flew at high altitudes with thinner air. So they parasitized ground-dwelling birds and altered their respiratory system for the sake of reproduction. They gave the birds the means to produce sophisticated sounds. The syrinx responsible for chirping. This is the proof that points to activation of Fox P2 in songbirds as well as humans. The Cenozoic era began with a rise in oxygen concentration which helped mammals to evolve and increase in size. The parasites then shifted to humans as a more effective host. Humans' bipedal upright walking meant that our throats could support larger resonating chambers. At first, vocal cord parasites entered humans using birds as their intermediate host. But eventually, they changed to conducting their entire life cycle within human hosts. What happened next is as I have already described. People took the vocalizing prowess given them by the parasites and made it language. And once the parasites could no longer use it as their mating call, they died out. Or in other words, the parasites overcame all evolutionary hurdles except humanity. Skullface shared his opinion on this matter. He said the Ethnic Cleansers project was sure to succeed. After all, the parasites had a grudge against us humans. To think we awoke them after such a long slumber, just so they could sate their thirst for vengeance. It is terrible. Unforgivable. And yet, it is what I have done. I learned of the vocal cord parasite's existence in literature belonging to the Foundation. It was little more than a theory. The question was, why does only Homo sapiens among all primates have highly developed language? Human versus everything else. The missing link between these was the mystery that gave rise to this theory. I was fascinated by the idea of their existence. In the Dene creation myth, the Neyo Dene, who first inhabited the world, were insect-like creatures. I came to imagine that those insect-like creatures could be humans living in symbiosis with the vocal cord parasites but I had not the faintest idea of how I could resurrect them. That is when Skullface came to me. What he offered me was not just assistance with my metallic archaea research. He told me the vocal cord parasites really existed. And not only did they exist, they had already been brought back to life in the modern age. An ancient human cadaver host to the parasites of the time. Cypher excavated such a cadaver from a permafrost region. 
and isolated the DNA coding of the vocal cord parasites. Naturally, they were long dead and could not be brought back. But there was an alternate vessel they could use. A relative species of the Pentastomida discovered in China. It had adapted to live in the nasal cavity of animal hosts but its genetic sequence showed signs of common ancestry with the focal cord parasites. Ontogenesis, a path of an organism to maturity, is like a roadmap of the phylogenetic evolution of the entire strain. Cypher used this to effect a reverse evolution of the modern parasite and resurrect the focal cord parasites. They interposed a developmental mechanism to the ontogenetic stage analogous to when the relative species first appeared, the point at which it split from the vocal cord parasites, forcing its evolution down the other path, the vocal cord parasite path. The larvae is produced by the vocal cord parasites, reborn. I do not know in detail how Cypher accomplished this, but clearly, they have access to high-level genetic technologies. Skullface said it was the work of a genius woman scientist, and that the relative species in question was first discovered by a group once called the Philosophers. I was tasked with modifying the resurrected parasites. He charged me with two demands. First, to add lethality to these organisms that had once lived in peace with man. By unleashing the larvae's latent desire to consume nutrients from the host's lung tissue, making them eat and eat until the lungs were destroyed. Second, to have both male and female inhabit the same host and copulate then and there only when exposed to specific pronunciations continuously over an extended time. What he would do to the Diné if I failed. I had no choice. Originally, I have no doubt Skullface's plan. Originally, the ultimate objective of the ethnic cleansing parasite project was the identification of not only languages, but of actual cultures. Language is deeply connected to ethnicity, but many languages are employed by multiple ethnic groups, and confrontation between those ethnic groups is by no means rare. If the cleanser parasites were to be a deterrent against ethnic conflict, they had to distinguish between groups using means other than pure language. The original plan called for this to be achieved by differences in the transmission vector. Each ethnic group has different lifestyle customs and eating habits. For instance, parasites living in shallow water and taken in through the skin could be used to target rice farming groups or parasites using cows as their intermediate host would be ineffective against cultures that abstain from eating beef. But that is a lofty goal indeed. The current parasites mainly rely on droplet transmission. It would take extensive time to alter the transmission route. I eventually learned that the ethnic cleansers project had been shut down. It was Skullface who put it back into operation. But despite that, he told me to forget about the transmission route and just focus on language identification. I do not know why. I understand that the Chinese philosophers who discovered the relative species of parasite originally planned to develop a phonogrammic Alexia parasite. The left temporal parietal region is home to the part of the brain that identifies the phonetic symbols of the English language. They wished to create a strain that would parasitize that region 
can suppress its literacy functions. The brain area responsible for identifying the logographs of Chinese, meanwhile, is in the left middle frontal gyrus. Meaning that even if native speakers of Chinese were infected with the parasite, the literacy would be unaffected. Old and new, east and west, there is no limit to the delusions of those in power. But this delusion threatens to become a reality. I have to do something to stop this. There must be something I can do. Finally burned out. The world is rid of his existence at last. Was he still alive? You could say that. But you could also say he'd been dead for decades. What's that supposed to mean? Biologically speaking, it's hard to say how much was his life. Side effects from the treatment? No. The primary effect. Keeping a dying host alive as long as possible. That is the whole point. But in the end, he grew too dependent on his children. Hmm. As if he had any other way to keep on living. He first underwent parasite therapy before the Soviet Union became his home. His body was horribly burned. Fire washed across his thin young frame and stole his skin and his throat. Even his lungs. Only through repeated therapies could the parasites keep him alive. Most of his life became something the parasites gave to him. And then he lost the ability to die. That is correct. The parasites live on past the host's death, still aiding cell composition. At that stage, there is no way to extract them from the host cells. There is no way of knowing when the last cell of Skullface's body would die. The only choice was to burn the whole thing. And his children, along with it. <laughs> and I am one to talk. When my life is snuffed out, I expect you to treat my body the same way. And when I burn, I will truly be one with my children for the first time. You say there were three English vocal parasites? According to Skullface, yeah. Skullface had two of the English strain with him. You burned both of them. There was an oil fire. I tossed him in. So that just leaves one. And you tell me Skullface said he used it. He said it was... Very close to me. Very close. One of your comrades. Or someone ordered to kill you. Or he could have been speaking metaphorically. Hmm. Metaphorically? Close to your spirit. Close to your heart. Someone who either loves you or despises you. The second one. Makes a long list. Whichever it is. Act with caution. Skullface implanted someone with the English language strain. Who it is, is irrelevant. Why? I tell you what Skullface really meant. Very close to you means you will be exposed. Mm. All the infected here have been given the Walbachia. Even if the vocal cord parasites infect them now, they cannot reproduce. 
But if there is a different host among us, host to the English strain... If that were the case, we'd see the symptoms. What about the non-English speakers? We have plenty of those, but the staff use English as a common language. But if that someone has not spoken English yet, and begins to speak it now, there'd be another outbreak. The final mating pair of the English strain must be found immediately. Skullface is gone, but his threat still remains on this base. Do you see what the final mating pair is? With him dead, those parasites are the stain he wished to leave upon the world. His thirst for vengeance in the flesh. Think. Does anyone here bear a grudge against you? Who would target you specifically? The ethnic cleansers that Code Talker mentioned, they weren't Skullface's true goal. All we have is circumstantial evidence, but here's my theory. It was Cypher who started developing the vocal cord parasites as bioweapons, parasitic weapons, and Africa was the testing ground for them. As Code Talker said, their purpose is the ethnic cleansing of only those who speak a particular language. So they could do a weapon of mass destruction to eradicate specific groups, races, ethnicities, or colonies by the language they speak. Or a kind of absolute language control. Or maybe a tool for those arrogant fools to build some misguided utopia. I can see plenty of uses for them. However, in practical terms, they wouldn't be as dangerous as you'd think. Counteracting the parasites is easy, after all. Cut them out of your throat to save your life, or just don't talk. That also prevents the infection from spreading. So if the international community were to find out about them, they'd no longer be the threat they were conceived to be. In which case, their targets would be limited to minority groups as a deterrent or a terrorist tool. It's hard to imagine Cypher developing something like that as a main weapon for their arsenal. That leads me to think We've only tugged on one little thread in Cypher's grand tapestry. An obscure corner of their work, possibly forgotten altogether. In any case, things changed. When Skullface was forced to relocate to Africa and he saw that thread dangling. All the time he continued that research, he was secretly following his own agenda. The ethnic liberator parasites. His English language strain. Skullface said there were only three samples of the English language strain parasite, and I think we can believe him. Bringing his ethnic liberators plan to fruition depended on creating an English version of the vocal cord parasites at all costs. But an English strain would have been useless to Cypher. Worse, it could have destroyed everything they'd built. It was the one type they couldn't allow. That means Skullface was forced to develop his English strain out of sight of Cypher's network. Naturally, he couldn't use the greenhouse facility Cypher had set up and filled with guinea pigs. Skullface must have found some secret place to create his precious few English parasites, hiding all evidence like a man cheating on his wife. Somewhere, an entirely standalone environment. And when his plan entered its final phase, he must have made the place disappear. Some little room could be anywhere, but now nowhere at all. We'll never know where he did it. But to elude Cypher's surveillance, it couldn't have been big. I believe Skullface was telling the truth. There were only ever three samples of the English language strain. Why activate Sahelanthropus in Afghanistan? This is how Skullface wanted things to play out. The Soviet Union secretly develops a new type of nuclear weapon and successfully deploys it in Afghanistan. Revealing the existence of Sahelanthropus results in a return to the glory days of the Cold War. The threat it poses reignites the nuclear arms race between the world's major powers. The demand for nuclear weapons increases around the globe. What if you then introduced a nuclear weapon anyone could get their hands on? Non-nuclear nations, militant groups of all shapes and sizes, they'd all jump at the chance. Soholanthropus was a marketing tool to sell nukes all around the world. But I think it's safe to say that plan was stamped out before it got up and running. 
The world's intelligence agencies never did turn up anything conclusive on it. After all, Sahelanthropus vanished before word could spread. Everything that's happened is already a fading memory, never to join the pages of history. Except for Cypher. Cypher won't forget. They'll already be working on something, quietly, beneath the surface. They'll use the pieces of data scraped together from this incident to build their own bipedal weapon. It'll take them a long time to complete it, but for now, the greed sector have found their new life's work. We'll have to be ready, too. Hewitt's dug up some interesting facts about our skull-faced friend. Nine years ago, he was exiled to South Africa, stripped of political power. The upshot's that he ceased being a serious threat, in Cypher's eyes anyway. They eased up on surveillance, giving him an opening to establish his own military unit, one that answered to his will alone. Those men likely had no idea their orders were coming from Skullface. They probably didn't even know the organization was a part of Cypher at all. Anyway, it was in South Africa where he found renewed interest in parasites. And when he discovered the vocal cord parasites, he began to make his plan. Wipe the English language out of existence. Free the world, not by taking men's lives, but by taking their tongues. In his eyes, the greatest symbiotic parasite the world's ever known isn't microbial. It's linguistic. Words are what keep civilization, our world, alive. There was something Skullface said. America is made up of many peoples, but those peoples never mix. Quite so. One nation, home to hundreds of different ethnic groups, many of whom stick to their respective living areas. Little colonies, not interacting with other groups. Going out of their way to avoid one another. Their land, organizations, relationships. Thus, the United States of America is no melting pot. It is more of a salad bowl. It is not made up from one people. But for its minorities to function in society, a common ground is needed. Language. Even if the country is not one, no. Because it's not one, a lingua franca is necessary. English. American hegemonism was born from the illusion that English could unite diverse ethnicities. In taking in people from around the globe, America became a microcosm of it. Now the boundaries between it and the rest of the world have become blurred. However different our neighbors may be, English enables us to create symbiotic relationships with each other. If English can bring unacquainted neighbors together in America, this should hold true for the world. This salad bowl that is the world can also become one. A ruler's greatest wealth is not money or land. It is the number of individuals under his control. Subjects who work, consume, are there to be used as pawns in war. For a capitalist ruler, his people's power becomes his power. You are the same with your diamond dogs. You spin it with your speeches. But what you're doing is bringing as much talent as you can into your little domain. Every person another feather in your cap. Yes. Since ancient times, every civilization's ruler has had the same idea. When people unite under one will, they become stronger than the sum of their parts. And the one will is the ruler's will. And what do rulers use to bring people together? Language. In the Old Testament, it is written that only one language was spoken in Eden. 
a shared tongue that united all of humanity. Mankind eventually grew aware of its power and harnessed that strength to build a tower to the heavens, the mighty Tower of Babel. This angered God, who splintered the language of man, and the tower was never completed. Languages emerged, and the earth was divided as men went their separate ways. Every age is the same. A ruler's first order of business, after conquering new land, is to force his tongue on its people. Ancient Rome, Napoleon, and now Zero. English is wrecking havoc around the world right now. The British Empire tilled the land with war as its home, then began planting the seed that is English. Eventually, American capitalism became the new instrument. To play its game of wealth, you only had to abide by one rule, English. By exploiting people's desires, English has become a leash that people gladly wear around their necks, it would seem. Yaat e. You disappoint me. Have you forgotten my face? Leave me be. <laughs> you won't respond to anyone else, so I figured it must be me you wanted to see. But now you won't even look at me. Have I not suffered enough? Not until you've eased my suffering first. To tell you the truth, old man, I'm in a bit of a bind. It's about your children. Hmm? You know what I mean? The parasites. The ones that infect a man's throat, killing him if he speaks their language. They must not be allowed to multiply. Hmm. You are allowed to live only in order to help me. But you don't want to, do you? So why not choose death instead? Because you want to protect the Digne and their land from me. <sighs> That's your purpose, isn't it? Don't lose sight of that now. <sighs> it's in your interest to cooperate. Because if you don't... Madness. The parasites can't detect your people's tongue. So I'll just have to resort to more heavy-handed means. I have the greatest respect for your people. I would rather avoid such a thing, but we don't always get our way. I was born a tiny moat in a mighty tempest. And until those winds abate, all I can choose is how to act when they blow me this way or that. Tell me, code talker, what happens to a man infected with a pair of your parasites? Can they be removed? Can the full-blown symptoms be prevented? It is impossible to remove the parasites alone. They have too close an affinity with humans. Then how do you stop the symptoms from developing? Weather will clear shortly. All right. I was hoping for an answer now, but perhaps you just need a little more time. I'll be back soon. I've set up shop, not far from here. We'll be seeing a lot more of each other. If you are close by, then it is almost complete. We're in the final phases. All that's left is to see if I can actually disable a nuke. With the help of your metallic archaea. Once that's done, I won't have to return here again. And your suffering will end. As will your peoples. We're almost finished, Code Talker. Each in our own way. My only regret will be not finishing you. There's nothing stopping you. 
I'm only alive because you want me that way. Ridiculous. As you wish. My regret is this misunderstanding between us. You and I, our goal is the same. We should be working together. A symbiosis. You do not know my mind. I simply want the Diné bloodline to endure. <laughs> really now? You're just another moat in the storm. How you react to all the slings and arrows, that's what counts. That's why you call those squirming monsters your children. What I have done is forbidden. Forgive me, all of you. The world should be left the way it is. You of all men should know that. Forgive me, but my schedule has changed. The time for grace and good manners has now run out. Please. Torture will not work on me. Surely you know this. Oh, I have no intention of getting rough with you. You haven't been beaten. Your hands aren't even tied. Just like me, you live in symbiosis with countless parasites. What wounds I might inflict, they'll patch right up. You might feel considerable pain, but I've no doubt you can withstand it. Then what do you plan on doing? I have a soldier standing outside. Nothing special about him, except that he always obeys. I have given him one instruction. Whenever I ring this bell, he passes on a message for me. That message is simply, go. What is this? After that, though, it gets complicated. The message will arrive at a room. A little bigger than this one. Nothing special. Some of your people are in this room, surrounded by my men. Enough of this. They pick them at random. No regard for age, gender. In that, I suppose, they're different from you. Not as discriminating. They tied them up, one by one. Blindfolded them. We had to maintain order, you understand? You bastard. Go. When they hear that, my men will pick one of your people and infect them with a parasite. Your parasite. It won't work on my people. True. The vocal cord parasite doesn't respond to your language. But what about English? An English strain. It exists. A ring of this bell, and they infect one person. If that person abandons the Navajo language, the English strain will trigger symptoms. You monster! So, it's quite simple. Every time I ring the bell, another of your people is infected. Don't do this! I don't want to do this. I'd rather not have to ring the bell. Which is why I'm hoping you will talk to me. What do you want? What else could you possibly want? You know the answer to that. How to prevent the symptoms caused by the parasite. You cannot control it like some slave. Forget the idea. Forget it? Unlikely. I will never tell you. What have you done? You made me do that. You black-hearted... Settle down. Don't use it again. Well, that is up to you. All you need to do is tell me what I want. How to prevent the vocal cord parasite symptoms. Why? Why do you need to know? The adult soldiers at Bwalea Masa are all dead. What? The parasite traveled downstream. How? 
It would appear that he was involved. Another demon who woke up from nine years of slumber. As a result, the vocal cord parasite spread through the village. I told you this would happen. It was an unfortunate accident. He is becoming an annoyance. He may stumble upon the truth sooner or later, but I suppose that is really of no consequence. One day, he too will pay for what he has done. Black Anna. The real demon is you. You know, this incident made me realize something. You are right. I should have acted with more humility. These creatures cannot be controlled. All the more reason I require a means to stop them. There is no such way. Oh, really? Wait! Don't ring it again. It is up to you. <sighs> Out with it! I see now. There must be more to it than that. What? They are in you. You use this land to breed more of my children. And not just here. No. In pursuit of your ethnic cleansers, you sifted through many language strains, finding hosts, breeding more and more. You would have been infected in the process infected with countless strains. <sighs> Most likely your mother tongues as well. Romania, Northern Transylvania. You found that one too. Yes, the Hungarian strain that responds to the CK's dialect. Silence! Black Anna. It is you who shall pay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Is this your retaliation, old man? Let my people go and never bother them again. You heard me. What now? What are you doing? <laughs> I am not afraid. I probably have every language strain inside of me. Meaning all the world's languages are already lost to me. But that suits me fine. If need be, I myself can produce whatever strain is needed. And that means nothing to you. If you are infected, you can never again speak your mother tongue. Otherwise, you will die. As will every one of your countrymen. A few words here and there won't trigger the symptoms. And besides, the time is not yet right to show this face in my homeland. Not until my revenge is complete. Now... Stop! We are out of time. I have to get going. Well... No! Uh. Radiation. It's radiation. Radiation? Of course. So it can be used. But how much? I do not know. Radiation denatures their reproductive cells, preventing them from mating. Same principle as the sterilization technique. The reproductive cells are more sensitive to radiation than the rest of the body. But I have not tested it. There is no telling what mutation could result, or how the host may be affected. Not to mention what could happen if this is done post-infection. I don't care. This plan goes into action now. As long as it works, the details can wait. You wouldn't be lying to me, of course, old man. I can guarantee nothing. I owe you my life. My body has been burned on countless occasions. But it survives, thanks to your 
children. That is why I trust you. Then do not repeat my mistake. What's that? In the West, it is said that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the East, it is said the man of flesh brings spiritual power to words. The people knew back then that these creatures carry the gospel. They do not belong in our hands. They must not be touched. <laughs> How enlightening. I'll remember that. Consider this my thanks. What are you catch? <laughs> no! Well then, I'm afraid it really is goodbye this time, Code Talker. <sighs> huh? There. There is no soldier. Huh. Now where did he run off to? Guess he wasn't as obedient as I thought. There never was any soldier. So long. You! How dare you!